welcome to Drawing from the Well, the preaching ministry of Recoboth Baptist Church with Senior Pastor Alan Stewart. We trust you'll be blessed and find faith, hope, and comfort as we draw from the principles and promises of the Word of God together. Oh, God. 
can be seated this morning. That's the first time we've opened up in service with that kind of song. And some of you dignified Baptists, you got scared to death when people started clapping this morning. Listen, don't you be afraid to be a Baptocostal today. Amen. If the Spirit of God moves in the place, you shout. It's okay to say amen. And if you want to run, just let me know. I'll get out of your way today and just let you run. But praise God for opening up a worship service strong today. It's great to see each of you here. And we want to take just a moment to welcome our guests that are here with us today. You're our honored friend to worship here with us today. Thank you so much for coming. You could have chosen an awful lot of other churches. We're thankful that you chose Recoba today. Let me give you a few prayer requests. Michael Tipton's father, as you know, passed away in the funeral service was yesterday in Cleveland, and so we're still praying for Michael and his family in the loss of his mentor in ministry and life, his friend, his father. I also continue to pray for Patty Hubbard, Melvin Petty, and Rebecca Brown, who are all dealing with forms of cancer and the various treatments that are necessary for those cancers. Also, you know that last week we were praying for Callie Cook, who was going to Vanderbilt to have surgery on her eyes. And I'm sad to inform you that as they were doing more in-depth study and evaluation on her, they have determined that surgery was not going to be possible because she has lost vision in all of her, both of her eyes. And so uh, we definitely want to pray for this family because, Jay, we know that that was certainly a a blow to the family and certainly knocked the wind out of their sails, broke my heart to hear the news. Well, we're praying for you because we know God's got a plan in this. Don't know what that plan is, but God always pulls His plans together. Amen. Also, continue to pray for Sylvia Privet, love lady who had a very serious stroke, and in fact, she is still in ICU and not doing well at all. Glenda Hall has got a 98-year-old uncle who also had a very serious stroke, and he's not doing well. One final thing, Judy Weiss will begin her radiation treatments this coming week, and so we want to be praying for her as she begins that journey and process as well. Isn't it good to be in God's house today? Let's pray and ask His blessing. Lord Jesus, we come to You so thankful for your mighty presence in this place. And I pray that you would speak loud and clear to the heart of our people. Help us to remember some lessons learned, valuable things that we need to carry with us into a new facility. As we go there, Father, may you remind us that we're still the same people. You're still the same Lord. But I pray that you would give us bigger eyes that we would see that we have a mighty big God who walks with us. May you today fill this place with your presence, receive the worship that we give to you from our hearts, and God, I pray that as we all leave here today, we'll have a better sense of who you are and your working in our life and in our church. I ask it all in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. As we stand together again, let's read. I will read the worship leader part. You read the part that says everyone. So it says this, give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done, sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all his wonderful acts, glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice, look to the Lord and his strength, seek his face always, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting, let all the people say, Amen. And praise the Lord. There's power in the blood. Let's lift that up together. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood.
salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to Sing praises to your name, O oh, Lord, praises to your name, O oh, Lord, for your name is great and greatly. Give glory to your name, oh Lord, glory to your name, oh Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I give glory to your You may be seated. As I walk.
1611 says thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence is fullness of joy at thou thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore When we pray for help, we trust that God cares. When we pray for patience, we trust that God's timing is perfect. When we pray for understanding, we trust that God is all-knowing. When we pray for forgiveness, we trust that God is merciful. When we pray for a blessing, we trust that God provides. When we pray with thanksgiving, we trust that He is good. When we pray to glorify God, we trust that He is almighty. When we pray, we trust God. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. If you have your Bibles this morning, would you take them and find the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter number 8 this morning, and I want to continue a series I began last Sunday, and will run up until we move into our first service in the new building. I'm kind on this series, Things Worth remembering. There are some valuable lessons that we should have learned and we need to hold on to as we go forward as a church. There will be things that will help us. There will be stepping stones. For understand this, we are not here today walking in the shoes of those who went before us. We are here today standing on their shoulders standing on their shoulders that we can see over the horizon and understand the goodness that God still has in store for us as a people. Deuteronomy chapter number 8 this morning. I want to read just a few verses here in the very beginning of the chapter. Let's start at verse number 1. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land 
which the Lord sware unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep His commandments or no. And He humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Missionary and author Lou Nichols tells the story of waiting in the Philadelphia airport on a flight to a distant city. I want to put it in his own words. Every half hour they would tell us that we would get an update in another half hour. I knew that the plane was there, the crew was there, all the passengers were sure there, but the flight just kept getting postponed. I must admit, by now, my patience was running low. When we were finally boarded and about to take off, the pilot explained what had been taking so long. He said, just before we were going to board you, our mechanics found a problem with two of our tires in a routine maintenance check we had to replace both of the tires. So all of a sudden, I was so grateful for the delay that had been frustrating. Now, there was a good reason for that particular airline delay. And I have to tell you, the airlines don't always have a good reason for their delays, but God always does. Now, it is true that patience is a fruit of the Spirit. But it is also true that none of us here like to wait. But yet in our lives, we find that we do it more regularly than we realize. We have to wait on an elevator. We have to wait at traffic lights. We wait in the lines at the grocery store. We wait on our cooks and servers to bring us food at a restaurant. We wait as we turn a computer on for it to totally load up. When you add up all the time that we spend in an average lifetime of 70 years, they tell us that the average person who lives 70 years has already spent three years of their life just waiting for something to happen. Now, here's the thing this morning. The real problem isn't the waiting. The real problem is what happens inside of our hearts while we're waiting. With that thought in mind, I want to speak to you on this subject this morning, the necessity of patience. In this portion of Scripture of Moses' farewell address, he's reviewing their history. He is re- he's painting a realistic picture of who they had been and where they had come from. You see, as Moses is writing, he doesn't want the new generation to fail like their fathers had failed. And what was the cause of so many of their failures? You can sum it up in one word, impatience. I want you to listen to Hebrews 10 at verse 38. For ye have need of patience. Just pause right there. Can you say amen to that this morning? We all have need of patience. Some of us have more need than others. There's not a one of us here that don't need just a little more patience in life. That after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. That tells me that there are some times as we journey with God, when God is going to cause us to wait. And when God causes us to wait, it's going to call for some intense patience. And I truly believe with all my heart that if you don't learn patience, you're probably not going to learn a whole lot else spiritually in your life either. Someone has written these words. Patience is a virtue. Possess it if you can. Found seldom in a woman, but never in a man. There's probably not an awful lot of truth to that. So what is patience? In the Bible, this word patience is more than just somebody trying to thread a needle. It means a whole lot more than trying to get through Atlanta traffic. It means a whole lot more than trying to work a calculus formula. 
It is a word that literally means to bear up under great pressure and to endure. Now understand this, patience is one of the hardest disciplines of all of our lives. But because of that, there are some very dangerous places in life when you do not possess it. For example, we need patience in our troubles. You know, the Bible tells us we have heard of the patience of Job. A man who lost everything worth value and meaning and significance in his life. But he handled it all with dignity and patience. More than one person has gotten mad, hard, and bitter at God because of the troubles, the circumstances they found in their life. We need patience when we're being persecuted. You remember the Garden of Gethsemane when soldiers come to take Jesus. Rather than depending on the power of the Spirit, Peter is impatient. He gets impulsive. He draws a sword and he takes off the ear of Malchus. Now I believe with all of my heart, he wasn't aiming for his ear. He wanted his neck. Ladies and gentlemen, we need some patience in these kind of moments. We need patience in our prosperity. Boy, if there's ever some lessons our church should have learned in its history, it would be this. When God is blessing, don't always make decisions based on what looks good on paper. What looks good on paper, what may be the voice of the majority, may not always be the perfect will of God. But then one of the most dangerous places we need patience is in those times that I call times of monotony. I'm talking about the day-in, day-out chronicles of the ordinary, the mundane, the routine, the same old, same old. You know, we can get antsy in these moments and feel the pressure to do something even if it's wrong. Bill Gothard said this, patience. It is the ability to idle your motor when you feel like stripping your gears. That's pretty good. Now again, our church in its long, rich history, we have learned some wonderful things by waiting on God. I mean, what you're seeing happen before our eyes is because we were patient. We waited on God. Our church, however, has also learned some hard lessons. We've been in some hard places because we didn't wait on God. And so this morning, I want to remind our church as we go forward, let's not forget this lesson. Let's always remember that wherever we go and whatever we're doing, let's wait on God to lead us. Now, why is it such a necessity? First of all, patience is necessary for maturity. I want you to notice in verse number 2 again. He says, And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee and to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep His commandments or no. Now sometimes in forty years, God led them on detours. Sometimes He led them down dead-end alleys. Sometimes he led them into some dry, mundane places in the wilderness. And I want to remind you that sometimes God led them around in circles and they thought they were going nowhere. Listen to it in Deuteronomy 2, in the last part of verse 1 to verse 3. And we come past Mount Seir many days. And the Lord spake unto me, saying, Ye have come past this mountain long enough, turn you north. In these moments when God leads you around in circles, it can be incredibly frustrating. But in all of it, God is testing. He is proving and He is maturing them. Now you'll find in the Bible, God is working and wanting to work in our heart and in our life a character quality known as patience. James gives us some insight in chapter 1 and verse 2. 
My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Now this word temptations has two meanings in Scripture. And the meaning right here in this verse is, it is a trial and a testing. There's a second meaning of this word, and it means an inducement to do evil. So there is a test that comes from God, but then there's a temptation, an inducement to do wrong, to sin or evil that comes from the devil. And so listen, when the temptation that comes from the devil, it is sent to cause us to stumble. But when God sends a test into our life, it is to strengthen us, to mature us, and to cause us to stand. One is meant for misery, and the other is meant for maturity. But listen to it more plainly in Romans 5 and verse 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Here's what he's saying. When we go through these tests in life, they do not work against us as believers. They are working for us. Again, James says, count it all joy when these things come in your life. Now, how do you do that? Well, listen, trials to a Christian are not obstacles. They are opportunities. And the only way the Lord can develop patience and character in our lives is by trying our faith. Now, why does God do that? Two reasons. First of all, there is the development factor. In James 1 again, beginning in verse 3, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Now, this word perfect here doesn't mean if we go through the test, we're going to be sinless. The word perfect here means mature. And it is the picture of ripened fruit. And so what God is saying here is, I want you to be a full-grown, ripened, mature Christian. Are you listening to me this morning? There is no maturity without patience. And there is no patience without a trial. Oswald Chambers said this, if you're going to be used of God, He will take you through a multitude of experiences that are not meant for you at all. They are meant to make you useful in His hands. God spent 25 years working in Abraham before He could give him the promised son. He spent 13 years working in Joseph's life, putting him through various testings before He could put him near to the throne in Egypt. He spent 80 years preparing Moses for 40 years of service. Now here's the point I want to drive home this morning. God must work in us before He can work through us. There is the development factor, but then there's the devotional factor. Proverbs 8, beginning in verse 34. Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the post of my doors, For whoso findeth me findeth life and shall obtain favor of the Lord. Now, do you know what we do so many times in our prayer life? We spend so much of our prayer life seeking the blessing more than we seek the blesser. And what God is saying here is, I want you to seek my face, not just my hand of blessing. Now listen, these trials that come into our life, they are intentional. You need to know that this morning or you'll get your feelings hurt at God. They are intentional. They're there to build endurance. They're to keep us going on, to keep us trusting, to keep us praying, and to keep us relying upon God. That's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 17, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Trials rightly used help us mature in our faith. And God is trying to grow us. God has grown us through some of the experiences and decisions that we have made as a church throughout all the history of our church. But He's trying to build patience, endurance, that will stay with God rather than getting ahead of God 
in hours of crisis. There's the second thing I want you to see. Patience is necessary for victory. Notice beginning in verse number 3. And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee to know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Thy raiment waxed not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. Not only did God feed them miracle manna every morning, but God kept their clothes from wearing out for 40 years. Their feet didn't even swell, we're told. Let me ask you in this place, is there anybody here that's still wearing the same shoes you bought 40 years ago? There's a good chance for most of your feet would not even fit in those shoes 40 years ago. And listen, we're told he did it for 40 years. You see, the lesson is when you endure, you mature. And when you mature, you become the victor rather than the victim. Ladies and gentlemen, there can be no victory in life without patience. You may say, but pastor, listen, I know that one day when I get to heaven, there I'm going to experience victory. Yes, you will. But I want you to put this verse in your mind. Romans 5 and verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in that verse, he is not talking about us reigning in the sweet by and by. He's talking about us reigning in the nasty now and now. Right here on planet Earth, we can know victory. God wants us to have a victorious life. He wants us to be strong. But most of us don't want this kind of victory that comes with endurance. Now listen, we like to talk about victory as Christians. We like to sing victory in Jesus. But have you ever thought that the word victory implies you had to go through a battle? We like to talk about the mountaintops and being on a mountaintop spiritually in life. But do you know what a mountaintop says? It says that you just came out of a valley. There cannot be any kind of healing unless somebody is sick. You see, the point is, if you want the blessing, you've got to be prepared to carry the burden and to fight the battle. There is no victory without patience and endurance. Because if you're not willing to bear the cross, you can't wear the crown. There are no cheap spiritual victories. Listen to Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 14. Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. Now let me ask you this morning, did the Apostle Paul ever know defeat? Some of you are probably thinking in your mind, boy, old Apostle Paul, he really had it easy. All he did was sit around and write books of the New Testament. Never really knew any difficulty. And every time he got into any kind of problem, he just simply wins. It was just victory all the time for Paul. Well, listen, Paul did know victory all the time. But I want you to understand what he went through to get it. In 2 Corinthians 4, beginning in verse 8, we are troubled on every side. Stop there for a moment. He's saying, you think you've got troubles? I've got them coming in hard and heavy on every flank of my life. We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. Persecuted, but not in despair. We're forsaken, not forsaken, we're not cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. 
Listen, regardless of how complicated the problems of life may be, I'm telling you with great certainty this morning, we can have the victory in Jesus Christ. There is no reason for a Christian to be born crying, to live complaining, and die disappointed. We can be victorious because of Jesus. In Hebrews 6 and verse 12, we're told to be followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Third thing I want you to see. Patience is necessary for prosperity. Turn over then to verse number 7 and look through verse 9. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains, and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and of honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. Now, as exciting as those days are going to be, don't forget, it took them 40 years to get there. Now, here's the lesson. When you don't understand, don't get hasty, don't get feverish, and don't become impatient. God wants to teach us patience, and here's why. Patience is the key that unlocks the door to every other blessing God wants to give you. Let me give it to you in James 5, beginning in verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Now what he's using here is the illustration of a Jewish farmer. And if you're not a patient man or woman, the last thing you need to ever be is a farmer. Jewish farmers would plant and sow and plow in what we call autumn, and they then had to wait till early spring to get the harvest. But the farmer prepares his field, and he knows he can't hurry the crop, so he waits. But it doesn't mean he's doing nothing while he's waiting. He cultivates. He weeds. He fertilizes. He waters to help mature this harvest. He is sure to come. A farmer, he is patient with his soil. He's patient with the seed. And he's patient with the seasons. A farmer can't control the weather. And so he knows too much rain will rot his crop. Too much sun will burn it up. And so he watches. He works and he waits. You ever wonder why God waits sometimes in our life? Let me give you a verse. Isaiah 30 and verse 18. Therefore will the Lord wait, that He may be gracious unto you, and therefore will He be exalted. But now at this moment in the message, I want to take just a moment to raise a red flag to our church. There is danger, there is peril in prosperity and comfort. Danger. As a church, we're about to step into some things we have never had before in the history of our church. God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in incredible ways. And I want you to think with me here. These Jews had been slaves in Egypt. You know what that means? They hadn't had much. Now they're going to move into a land. They're going to be living in their own houses. Watching their flocks and their herds increase. They had been nomads out in a wilderness. But now they're going to be settled down in a rich land. Enjoying peace and prosperity with their children and their grandchildren. Now here's the red flag. How easy it would be for them to become proud. 
And so wrapped up in the blessings that God gave them that they forgot the one who blessed them. How easy it would be to forget how helpless they were before the Lord had rescued them. How easy it would be to begin to think that their success was because of their own strength, their own wisdom, their own creativity. Or even worse, to begin to think, we deserve this. May I remind you this morning, the only thing we have ever deserved was hell. Did you hear me this morning? That's why God gave us something called grace that we didn't deserve. God has been gracious to our church. Again, throughout the years of our church's history, about 95 years, There have been countless occasions and moments when our church, by human standards, should have went under. It should have been done. The tombstone should have been erected. But God gave a resurrection of grace. And God is now giving things to this church we have never had, just as He did to the children of Israel stepping into the promised land. There's a Danish proverb that says this, Give to a pig when it grunts, and give to a child when it cries, and you'll have a fine pig and a bad child. (laughs) Listen, Moses had a fear that when they got into the land, they would forget the one who had blessed them. And so you know what he does? He does something very strange here in this passage of Scripture, in this text. He encourages them to pray before they eat. Then He encourages them to do something by verse 10 that I have never caught before in the Word of God. And I'm going to be honest with you, very transparent. And I would say, you're going to agree with me this morning. You've never done this either. Never one time have I done this. I have prayed before my meals. By verse 10, the challenge was pray after you're full. How many of us ever pray after we've ate the meal? You know what happens? After we've ate the meal, we got fat. We got comfortable. We forgot what God had just given to us. May God help us to always keep in the forefront of our mind. The Lord gives, but He can also take away. There's a last thing I want you to see, and that is patience is necessary for tranquility. Notice again in verse 7. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills. Do you see here that God is giving them much more than prosperity? I mean, God's telling them, I'm going to give you some lakes, I'm going to give you some streams, I'm going to give you some creeks, I'm even going to give you some waterfalls coming out of the mountains. When you read that and understand, is there anything that comes to your mind that He's saying to His people? Oh, it was a whole lot more than I'm going to give you something to drink. I'm reminded what David said in Psalm 23, verse 2. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, well watered. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Both now paint pictures of peace, serenity, and tranquility. What price would you pay this morning to have total peace of mind and heart? You know, this world that we're living in is experiencing a slow disintegration from a lack of peace. Watch the news every night. Well, you really don't need to watch the news. But if you watch the news, boy, we're seeing pictures of peace marches, peace signs, and peace treaties that are trying to happen in the world. But I hate to bust your bubble. As long as there is lust and sin and hate in this world, there will never be universal peace. 
God said this in Isaiah 55, 57 and verse 21. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Most people in this time in our history are filled with anxiety, trauma, and stress. Few people are living in true peace. You know, they tell us that right now tranquilizer sales are at an all-time high. Here in America, right now, today, Americans are taking 15 billion aspirins a day. Here's the point. There's no happiness. There's no tranquility without patience. Do you know that, and notice this about people that are impatient. They're always unhappy. Let me give you a verse. James 5, beginning in verse 10. Take my brethren, the prophets who has spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Here it is. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You cannot be happy and impatient at the same time. Now what is it that most people do when troubles come to their life? Well, some people try to escape it. Others, they try to avoid it. Some people just give up and they drop out. Then there are others who get cynical. Man, they get mad and bitter and they shake a fist in the face of Almighty God. But then there are others who just march right on past God and try to handle things all by themselves. There have been some times in our church's history when we've made this mistake. Well-meaning moments, thinking it's going to bring peace. And do you know what it brought? Turmoil. Do you remember Abraham? He ran ahead of the Lord and he finds Hagar. Instead of bringing peace to his home, he brought great sorrow. Moses ran ahead of God. He murdered a man and he had to spend 40 long miserable years on the backside of the desert with sheep learning patience. George MacDonald gave one of the greatest quotes, most profound things I ever heard when I was a young preacher. I've never got over this quote. And whatever a man does without God, he must either fail miserably or succeed even more miserably. When we get ahead of God, do you know that sometimes in those moments the greatest judgment God gives is to just let us have our own way. And then when we get what we want, we don't want what we've got. Reminds me of a story I heard about a little boy who loved pancakes. One day his mother decided she was going to cook this little boy all the pancakes he could ever want. He ate the first ones with delight and enjoyment. She just kept setting them in front of him, one pancake after another. Finally, the little mother said to her son, Johnny, do you want another pancake? He said, no, ma'am, I don't even want the last ones that I've just had. You see, when we get what we want, we then don't want what we get. Here's a lesson. Impatience and unbelief usually go together just as patience and faith do. Impatience will steal your peace. It will steal your tranquility. It will steal your happiness. I'm telling you, friend, patience brings tranquility. That's why Paul said in Philippians 4 and verse 11, For I've learned. In whatsoever state I am, whatever I'm dealing with in life, therewith to be content. You see, a little child who doesn't learn patience, he's not going to learn much else either. When the believer learns to wait on God, he then discovers God can do some great things for us. Here's a thought I want to put in your mind near the end of the message here. If we will continue to be a people that will just wait on God. God gives the best to those who leave the choice to Him. Can I say that to you again? God gives the best to those who leave the choice to Him. And my friends, that's something worth remembering.
Let me close with this illustration this morning. In his book, Sabbatical Journeys, Henry Nguyen writes about a special relationship that trapeze artists have with one another while they're performing. He had some friends who were known as the Flying Rudellas. They described to him what goes on between the flyer and the catcher. They told him that the flyer is the one that lets go. And the catcher is the one who catches. As the flyer swings high above the crowd on the trapeze, the moment comes when he must let go. He then arcs out into the air. His job is to remain as still and as patient as possible. Let me pause right here for just a moment. (laughs) 75 feet from the floor in midair. You better be patient. Because disaster comes if you're not. And then they wait for the strong hands of the catcher to pluck him from the air. Then one of the Rudellas said, The flyer must never try to catch the catcher. But must wait in absolute trust. The catcher will catch him. But for the catcher to be able to do that, the flyer must let go completely and trust that he is going to be caught. Do you know what we have done in building a building with a price tag that it's got? (laughs) We're free falling. We have let go in absolute trust. Do you believe this morning that the catcher will catch us? With all of my heart, I believe it. There is a necessity for patience. Eugene Peterson gave this paraphrase of Romans 8, 24. Waiting does not diminish us any more than waiting diminishes a pregnant mother. We are enlarged in the waiting. May God enlarge us as we wait and we pause And He fill us with the goodness and glory that He's got in store. Heads bowed and eyes closed. They come with a song of invitation. Again, our church has learned some wonderful lessons, but we've also learned some hard lessons. We don't ever need to forget them. Even here in our own community, there are or churches who have done the same thing. They've got ahead of God and thinking they were bringing peace and they brought turmoil, division, and chaos. May we learn the lesson now that we never repeat it again. I know you know that I love history, but can I tell you this morning what history is? A.T. Pearson said it like this, history is is His story. God is the one that is writing the story of Recoboth Baptist Church that used to be Mountain View Baptist Church that used to be First Baptist Church of Saudi. May God take us wherever He wants to go. May we follow Him faithfully. In a moment, I'm going to pray. We'll stand to our feet in a hymn of invitation. Don't know what decision you may need to make today. Not sure what God may have spoke to any person's heart. But whatever He's speaking to you today, would you obey Him? Maybe it's just simply this. You have need of patience. Holy Spirit of God, may you take this message today, seal it in our hearts. God, keep it in the forefront of our minds to always remember To wait, be patient, trust you, and goodness, blessing, the promises, and the rewards come when we do. And I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand and sing, would you come today? Draw me close to you. Ever let me go. I lay it all down again 
to hear you say that I'm your friend. You are my desire. No one else will do. Cause nothing else could take your place To feel the warmth of your embrace Help me find the way Lord, bring me back to you Well, God bless you. Thank you for being here today. It's been a good day to be in God's house. I don't know if you've had the opportunity or if you wanted to, to go over to the new sanctuary. We've got plenty of Sharpies. If you want to write on the sanctuary floor only, those scriptures that may be important to you because I want you to have an opportunity to stand on the Word of God as we move in and we begin to worship there as well. Many have already done so. If you want to do that immediately following the service, you feel free to go over. There'll be those there that'll help you get in. Just be careful. We've got stuff down to try to keep all the sheetrock dust and stuff that's still on the floor. We've got brooms to try to push it away, but it only does so good. So if you want to do that, you're more than welcome to do it after the service. And for those that have not yet ventured out and would love to come and do that, we'll send an email out to those that are listening via live stream so that we can set up some time during the week that they can come up here alone and have an opportunity to do that as well. Again, God bless you. Let's go forward with patience. Let's wait on God as we've done and watch Him do some wondrous things. We've not yet even tapped the surface of what God's got in store for our church. God bless you as you leave. Larry, I'll let you close this out. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. It has been good to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. But what a day it's going to be when we all get to heaven. Amen. Amen. Let's sing that chorus together a couple times. Oh, and we.